so let's get started. Our first speaker is Dr. Munster, and he'll give us an introduction to academies. Thank you, and uh, I'm very happy to be invited here. Uh, I wrote in my abstracts that I promised that experts would be bored senseless. It's been pointed out to me that the contrapositive of this is rather rude. Um, I'm implying that if you're not bored senseless, then in my opinion, you're not an expert. So maybe it's I offend some of you. And, well, let's see who gets offended. Uh, also note that I didn't promise that non-experts would not be bored senseless. So let's see. Uh, here's the plan. Uh, the first part will occupy probably most of the talk, and that will be just basic ideas of n categories. The second part will be a discussion of the difficult problem of simply defining the term n category. And the last section, if I get to it, will be um, some kind of summary of the, of the current situation. So, rather pompously I've called it state of the art, but a more accurate description might be difficulties. Of which there are many. So before I actually say what uh, an n-category is, let me try and give you some historical background. Uh. And this will doubtless be incomplete and possibly inaccurate. Um, the, the study of n categories and various related structures is called higher dimensional category theory or simply higher category theory. So I'll put this in the middle of this picture. Various things have, have fed into this theory, or even caused it to come to exist. Uh, so first let me mention category theory itself, the kind of internal motivation. And I'll need some space, so I'll remove this title. at least in its simplest form, has actually been around for a long time. Uh, I think it was Charles Erasman in the 50s or 60s who introduced it. So he should certainly be mentioned. Um, there's also been one kind of motivation coming from um, logic and foundations, in particular Michael Mackay has been keen on the idea of, of founding, um, really founding mathematics on higher category theory. It's really pushing the idea that you never, you, should, you never want to think about equality of objects of a category. You don't care if two groups are equal, only if they're isomorphic. So there has been some um, motivation from that direction. motivation from topology. So, for 
for instance, there's been a very influential idea that n groupoids, which are a special kind of n category, somehow corresponds to homotopy n types. Um, what else? Um, oh yeah. So early on, uh, at least as far back as the 1980s, um, the idea has been around that non-abelian cohomology can be done well using n categories. And I haven't got time to explain any of these things at all, so I'll just let you take it or leave it. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention under this heading is that uh, the idea of categorification, taking some set-based structure and replacing it with a category-based structure, has been particularly successful in knot theory. This is the basis of uh, these new knot invariants of Kovanov. I'm just listing some things here that have caused this theory to, uh, to come about and that have informed it. Um, I'll rather daringly say something about physics here. <coughs> so, uh, there's a fairly well-known connection between um, topological quantum field theory uh, and higher categorical structures of cobordisms. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention under physics is the solution of the deformation quantization problem by Konsevich, which involved, importantly, some higher algebraic structures, A infinity algebras and L infinity algebras and so on. And then, finally, I mean finally for this list, um, there's been some input from theoretical computer science. Uh, there's been a long-standing problem about finding a good language for concurrency, for describing concurrent systems. And this, some of the people interested in that have, have wondered whether higher category theory has a role to play. Um, and this is related to the small field known as directed topology. Okay, so perhaps this is uh, just a list of buzzwords, um, in which case ignore it. But, um, uh, but you see from this at least that there are many envisaged connections between higher category theory and other subjects. Um, now, we all know that the tentacles of category theory, ordinary category theory, have reached far into very diverse parts of maths and logic and computer science and physics. Um, but the, the power of category theory comes from the fact that it does not belong to any one application. It's not a subset of, of any of these applications. And the same thing is true of higher category theory. Um, those of us who've been involved with higher category theory for a while have perhaps sometimes been guilty of overemphasizing the connections with other subjects and underemphasizing the fact that it has an independent existence. So now, for instance, you hear some people speaking as if higher category theory was a subset of homotopy theory. It's not. It has its own existence, and that's what gives it its power. Um, so, it is something you can study for itself if you wish to. <coughs> <coughs> or 
although the hope is that it will be usefully applicable to many other areas. Okay, so it's about time I said what an M category is, at least roughly. years of people's lives. So this is going to be a really rough answer. It's a very rough definition. Uh, so first of all, um, an N category isn't a kind of category, it's a, it's a generalization of the notion of category. Um, and N here is either a natural number or it's infinity. taking n to be infinity, you never stop. Go on forever. Okay, so this the definition is not over yet. Um, but this part of the definition is analogous to the part of the definition of category that just says you've got some objects and some morphisms. Nothing so far has been said about composition. So let me say it. Here the 
of vagueness begins. Um, you've got various kinds of composition. Um, let me draw the kinds of composition you have in the lowest dimensions. Just as in a category, you can compose the ordinary arrows, the one morphisms. Two morphisms. Well, the two morphisms are kind of two-dimensional things, and you can imagine um, putting one on top of the other, but you can also imagine putting one next to the other. So we're we're kind of we're inside a plane. We can do vertical things or horizontal things. So the vertical composition looks like this. Horizontal one, well, that's this time you compose them like that. Along the top, you get the composite of one cells, and similarly along the bottom. <coughs> and, well, the results are two cell like this. You need some kind of notation um, to distinguish this kind of composite from that kind of composite. The tradition is to use a star here. Um, and maybe you can imagine that there'll be three kinds of composition of three morphisms because. You can put them next to each other like this, like that, or like that. There are three dimensions to move in. Um, and so you've got composition, you've got identities, which I'll say nothing about. And of course, you want them to kind of fit together. If you were defining category, you'd say you're satisfying associativity and identity laws. Um, there's much more complicated stuff to think about from here. Uh, um, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna cop out completely and just say all fitting together nicely. And I'm gonna delay for as long as possible explaining anything about what that phrase means. You mean the compositions? Huh? You mean the composition? Yeah, 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 thank you. The compositions fit together nicely, not the, not the morphisms themselves. Um, well, that's kind of a long definition, and it's even, I mean, it, it's not even a definition, it's extremely rough. Um, so let me try and give you some kind of orientation. Uh, Tom, I'm sorry, it must yes. be B there, right? With the upper right there. Ah, yes, thank you. This one? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the most trivial case is n equals zero. Then you stop at the, well, the zero morphisms, the objects. All a zero category is, is a collection of objects. It's a set, a class, if you like. What about n equals 1? Well, then you stop here, you've only got objects and one morphisms, and you've only got this kind of composition, and so it's just a category. Uh, two categories are something genuinely diff uh, different. Um, now, if you're meeting this for the first time, uh, this part might look bewildering because if you think of your, you know, the 
the favourite categories in the world are things like the category of vector spaces. You've got a pair of vector spaces, a pair of linear maps. What on Earth is a morphism between linear maps? Well, it doesn't, you know, it's not really clear there's any natural concept of this. So, um, so I need to give you some examples where there is a natural uh, notion of higher morphism. So I'm going to give you a whole lot of examples. Uh, Okay. Well, the first family of examples you might regard as a bit of a cheat, but you can simply draw some n categories. Draw a two category. Uh, it's got two objects. It's got two one morphisms. I'm not going to draw the identities, which are invisibly sitting there too. And it's got two non trivial two morphisms. And this looks like <coughs> a, uh, a two sphere, so I'm going to call it S2. Um, in principle, I should tell you what the compositions, the various kinds of composition are, but there's nothing non trivial to compose here, so there's, there's, uh, there's actually nothing to say. Now, perhaps I should leave this parts of this definition up. categories are functors <coughs> and the two morphisms, well, so two morphisms should look like this, so here A and B are categories and F and G are functors, we want some notion of map between functors, well that's natural transformation. Just as the, in some sense, the fundamental example of a category is the category of sets, the fundamental example of the two category is the two category of categories. Let me write this. Um, so the fundamental example of a category, or if you like, a one category is the category of sets. Well, sets are zero categories, so you might write that as zero cat. Have room anyway. The fundamental example of a two category is cat, which you might call one cat. And 
the pattern continues, at least in the sense that almost everyone hopes that if the language is set up correctly, then there will be, for each n, an n category of n minus 1 categories. And this will somehow be the fundamental example. Now let me do a, um, a much less self-referential example. So this one is uh, this one's all about manifolds and cobordism. So uh, first of all, choose your favourite n, a natural number or infinity. So, for instance, well, one, 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 morphism, sorry, one morphisms are meant to go between objects. So I need to tell you, for instance, what a one morphism from this thing to um, the corresponding two-point thing is. So a typical morphism from vertically from here to here uh, let me do a 4.1 Two morphisms are going to require me to draw a picture, so let's see if this goes. Two manifolds with corners. Okay. 
Okay, so let's just look back at the general picture of a two morphism. <coughs> um, Example over here. So my what am I doing? My A is a pair of points as a zero manifold. Um, my B is uh, four points. My F is meant to be something along these lines, uh, but it's going to be a different. Thing. It's going to look like this. My G is that there. So I'm telling you what a typical two morphism from this one morphism to that one morphism is. Well, um, I'm going to draw one particular example of such a two morphism. Is So first of all, I'm going to draw F in a, in a horizontal plane, so I'm thinking of it anyway. So F looks like this. Uh, then I'm going to draw G. And you'll see the reason for the dotted lines in a moment. So that's G. I'm going to simply join the, uh, the two copies of A together and the two copies of B together similarly. Okay. And now I want to have some kind of surface that interpolates into what I've already got. And I think I get it I guess if I just draw this line here. So we've got a oh I see I have to draw this too. <coughs> right. Is that good? That's good. Okay. So what we've got is a the the main part of this picture is a saddle, but then there's also half of a pipe on the right hand side. Um, so the two morphism is something that interpolates from the first one morphism to the second. And then, well, clearly I'm not going to do any more drawing, um, but you finish by saying that n morphisms are, well, I really want to say n morphisms are isomorphism classes. of n manifolds with corners. And you compose these things by, by sticking them together in an evident fashion. Uh, okay. So one interesting feature of this particular example is that every Every morphism has a dual, right? If you have a, a manifold, you can just turn it backwards, swap the inputs and the outputs. Um, but that dual is not an inverse. So this is a good example of a, of a higher category where almost none of the higher morphisms are invertible. Uh, so, so every, every morphism K morphism that is for K 
bigger than zero. <coughs> has a dual obtained by turning it back to front or upside down. Um, but very few morphisms have inverses. At least when n is less than infinity, if n is equal to infinity, then the duals turn out to actually be inverses. Uh, okay. So I might not get very much more done than telling you lots of examples, but that's okay. One of the core motivating examples of an n-category is this. Top, topological spaces. And I think I'm going to jump straight to infinity at this point. So there's an infinity category as follows. Well, as usual, just as in the familiar category of topological spaces, the objects of topological spaces, and the one morphisms are the continuous maps. Two morphisms. Well, a two morphism is meant to interpolate between two different continuous maps having the same uh, domain and codomain. <coughs> and it's going to be defined to be a homotopy. So if you've got a pair of continuous maps like this, a two morphism from one to the other is a homotopy from F to G. defined as a, as a continuous map with a certain property. It's a map from the interval across the domain to the codomain. So you can talk about homotopies between homotopies. Well, you know how to compose continuous maps, but um, homotopies can be glued together. And this gives you all the compositions you need. So it's like gluing homotopies. Now, if you contemplate this last line hard enough, then you'll see that there's a uh, subtlety here. Because the definition of homotopy involves the unit interval. And when you compose homotopies, you have to re-parameterize the unit interval. You know, you, if you're doing a path, for instance, you go along it in one second, then you go along another path in the second second. And if you want to do the whole thing in one second, you have to re-parameterize the interval of length 2 to become an interval of length 1. And um, what you find is that doing this does not give you an associative composition. So this uh, infinity category here does not obey strict associativity laws or strict unit laws. 
So it's just the same issue as when you define the fundamental group where you have to push it out by something. And that opens up the whole can of worms. So I'm just going to break off these examples for a moment. Um, So what I just said was that composition in top isn't strictly associative or unital and so on. So, the terminology that's used in this situation is that um, top is not a strict infinity category, because that would mean that you did have equations like this. It's a weak one, which means you only have this associativity up to an interpolating three morphism. of strict n category for any n, strict <coughs> infinity, but much, much harder, I mean substantially hard, to give a good definition of weak n category. So I think I'll give one more example and then uh, do some other things. Uh, you know what? I started the seven cards so I should finish it. 3, 2. Um, what should I do? Can I, can I just ask? Um, yes. So you said, I think, that it's hard to give a definition of a weak end category. Yes. yes. Is it hard to give a definition of a weak end category? Yes. Um, yes, I mean, it's slightly harder, depending on what you're viewing. I mean, in some approaches it's just as easy, in some it's, it's harder. It's, um, Uh, so, okay, I think I'll actually leave it there for examples and, and say some other things. Uh, 
So there's a, uh, there's a kind of distracting fact which somehow is better known than is helpful. Um, uh, and this fact is that every weak 2 category is equivalent to a strict one. So the level of 2 categories, it seems to be pointless to do this difficult weak stuff. is that this fails for categories of higher dimension. And, um, <clears throat> and it's not just that it's possible to cook up some obscure example where it fails. It fails in almost all examples of, of weekend categories when n is bigger than 2. Um, that, uh, that that one is usually interested in. So it's a really fundamental thing, and that's what I meant when I said that this isn't just some annoying um, technicality. Tom, what does yes. equivalent mean in this setting? I'd rather not say. <laughs> um, that, I mean, you could also ask what does n category mean in this in this in this setting. That um, it's there are problems of definition for uh, at all levels. Um, now I think. What I'm going to do um, is just skip uh, B, which was part B was meant to be about ways of defining n category, and, and just make some comments about about um, the current state of the art. So B is not happening. Um, So, I've been talking a lot about n categories, but of course, ordinary category theory crucially involves functors and natural transformations and um, equivalents uh, and all sorts of accompanying notions. So, I'll say a few words about the totality of n categories, in other words, not just the things themselves, but uh, what they form. <coughs> if you come up with um, a notion of a good notion, a good definition of n category, then you really you also want to come up with a good notion of functor between them and transformation between functors and equivalences and so on. <coughs> uh, as I mentioned, strict n categories are rather easy. Um, I'm going to talk about the weak ones here.
now let me say something about the definitions of n categories themselves. Well, the first thing to say is that lots of people have come up with ways of defining n category. So there have been at least a dozen definitions proposed. Uh, some things are known about how those definitions compare to each other, what kind of equivalences there are, but to a large extent we're in the dark. Uh, so um, let me put it rather blandly, our knowledge of how they compare is incomplete. <coughs> now, you might think that's <coughs> a scandal. You might think that means that people who work on higher category theory lack intelligence or energy. Um, but there's actually a very interesting fundamental difficulty, which is you can ask whether two definitions of n category are equivalent, but what does that mean? It's actually entirely unclear. So, uh, let me just say out loud what's going on. Um, suppose you come up with a definition of topological space, and I come up with a definition of topological space, and we want to know whether they're the same definition. Well, topological spaces form a category, so the acid test is whether your category of spaces is equivalent to my category of spaces. Okay. Now, let's suppose that you come up with a definition of n category, and I come up with one too. We want to compare them. The natural question is, is your totality of n categories equivalent to my totality of n categories? But I said earlier that n categories are thought to form an n plus 1 category. So we want to know whether your n plus 1 category of n categories is the same as mine. But whose definition of n plus 1 category are we going to use? Right? We need, before finding out whether our n categories are the same, our definitions of n categories are the same, we need to know whether our definitions of n plus 1 category are the same. So we're causing a vicious circle, and that's the difficulty. Um, there are various ad hoc solutions. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm over time. I'm just going to say one more thing, because if I don't, it'll cause confusion, I think at least with Ika's talk um, later. There's, there's a rather irritating terminological difficulty. Um, the term N category has been around, as I said, I think since the 50s and 60s. And, um, but recently, uh, Jacob Lurie has been making an investigation of a particular kind of infinity category, a so-called infinity one category, which means infinity category with a special property that all two morphisms and three morphisms and so on are invertible. Now, uh, he needed some name for for, for these particular kinds of infinity category, and the name, well, he chose a name which could have been designed for maximum confusion. He decide, decided to call these infinity categories, these particular special infinity categories, just infinity categories. So the result of this is that some, when some people say infinity category these days, they mean that particular kind of infinity category, and I believe in Eka's abstract is used in that narrow sense. Um, but in order to, I mean, when someone says infinity category, you need to take a moment to decide which sense they mean it in. Um, a rule of thumb is that if it includes, if the word, the term infinity category occurs in the same sentence as the word Lurie, then it's meant in the narrow special sense. Um, so let me just uh, write something here.
And unfortunately, this terminology has caught on in some circles. In which all k morphisms for k bigger than 1 are invertible. So, top, the example I gave you earlier, is a good example of this. Because homotopies are invertible, but continuous maps are not. Um, so this is something you need to watch out for. Uh, okay, I'll stop there. What about n equals minus 1? Yeah, okay, so um, there are good reasons for saying um, that a minus 1 category is a Boolean truth value. In other words, there are two minus 1 categories. One of them is called true and one of them is called false. Um, and there are, I think, equally good reasons for saying that a minus 2 category, there's only one minus 2 category, or you can call it what you like, there's only one of them. Um, uh, yeah, I, don't, I haven't got time to explain that, but thank you for the, uh, the prompt. It's probably <laughs> the question is that there are some strict mathematical sense in which set is a special example of zero category that gets. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, there's been some work on <coughs> n toposes. So, for instance, um, Mark Weber has been recently investigating uh, two toposes, um, and so that's axiomatizing, trying to axiomatize or bring out some of the special features of cat among of cat among two categories. Um, I. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to say. Uh, I didn't exactly understand what uh, you mentioned as kind of neglected problems about uh -huh. fungi. If I understood this correctly, these things for M categories should be part of the <coughs> N plus one category, right? Or, yeah. or you mean something else? Here? Um, so if you just well, generally think about definition of L plus one category, you somehow keep that for M. Um, it is believed that when everything has been set up correctly, there will be a particular n plus <coughs> one category consisting of n categories, functors between n categories, transformations between those, and so on. Um, I think that there is no framework in which that's been proved. Um, does everyone want to contradict me? Oh, okay. I believe there is one framework in which I... <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, so... Okay. Yeah, so there, there is no other issue here, kind of just general definition. Uh, I mean, there are... Well, one, one reason why this is important is if you want to compare different different definitions of n category, you need to know what equivalence means. If we go back and forth between my definition and yours, okay, you expect to come back to something equivalent to what you started with, but no better than equivalent. So, um, you mentioned that with the uh, co-borders, for example, yeah. did, did you say that um, when you allow, um, when you're in the infinity category, then mm. you have the values, the morphisms are invertible by their dual. Well, okay, so this is the invertible meant in a suitably weak sense. Um, and the, all axioms in a weak infinity or weak end category are, are sort of deferred to the next level. Um, so when you when you change your notion of sameness from equality to isomorphism, you start referring to one morphisms. Um, when you change it to equivalence, you start referring to two morphisms. So it's, it's like the difficulty gets gets delayed until the next level, and the next level, and the next level. And because there's no ceiling, the difficulty gets delayed forever and somehow disappears. Um, if you want a better answer, you should talk to Eugenia Cheng in the coffee break. Cool. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, the fact that two categories, we two categories can always be stratified as disturbing. But of course, this also has very nice features. The fact that you can stratify uh, a thing about graph or counters or something. Is there sort of a, an understood concept of strictly fireable n category? 
Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, there's certainly been lots of work on to what extent can you make a weekend category strict. You can kind of make, for instance, you can make a composition of one morphism strict at the expense of leaving everything else weak. Um, another way in which this fact is, is distracting is, well, so the person who first wrote about uh, week two categories was, was Benabu, calling them by categories, and he was very keen to emphasize that um, you shouldn't just think about week two categories, you should think about weakness of the functors and transformations between them, and while you can turn any week two category into a strict one, it's false, for instance, to think that you can turn a weak transformation between two categories into a strict one. Um, so if you really want to work with the totality of two categories, you can't always just pass to the strict thing. So that's yeah. So is n cat a canonical example of a strict n plus one category? Um, right. So I was uh, I was vague in my notation. Um, if you collect together all strict n categories and strict functors, etc., between them, they form a strict n plus right. one category. And that much is fairly easy to, to establish. If you collect together all the weak ones, then they should form a weak n plus one category. Okay, so let's thank our speaker again.